Hey, what's up, White Knuckle Army? Thanks for tuning in to episode number 10 of the White Knuckle Podcast. Well, welcome back to episode number 10 of the White Knuckle Podcast. Today, I had the privilege of speaking with Gene Wenzel. I think it was somewhere back around 1981 that Gene Wenzel published Bow Hunting, Rutting Whitetails. And if I'm not mistaken, that was likely the start of his career in the outdoor industry. To say that my conversation with Gene was anything but usual would certainly be an understatement. My every intention was to speak to Gene that day about hunting and talk about hunting we did. My intention was to prod and pry at him for some of his secrets on hunting giant whitetails as he has had so much success doing in the past and our conversation ended up going many different ways. Some of it was certainly concentrated on whitetails and a lot of it wasn't. Uh, I hope you find this episode valuable. I hope you find all our episodes valuable, but this one in specific was different than all of the other ones that I've done so far. Todd was away and couldn't be with us, and that really opened the door to having a conversation of that went in many directions. With that, I'll just caution you I did rate the show explicit. We get into some very small, minor, explicit things and felt it was necessary that we titled the show explicit. So I sincerely hope you enjoy my conversation with Gene Wenzel. And more important than any of that, I hope you get the message that Gene really is trying to get across because it's very valuable. And I absolutely walked away from this show looking back at maybe some choices I made with respect to my kids and how I mentored them in hunting and how I could have changed things and maybe done a better job. So with that, sit back, relax. Here's my conversation with Mr. Gene Wenzel. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the White Knuckle Podcast. Today, I have uh, the luxury of speaking with Mr. Gene Wenzel. Gene, along with his brother, Barry, are probably widely considered to be two of the best deer bow hunters that uh, that have probably ever carried a bow, at least in my opinion. Um, they've been hunting for a long time, and I would say that they probably hunt the old-fashioned way. Is that fair to say, Gene? Yeah, you say the old-fashioned way. Um, I, I, we actually used recurve bows or long bows. I, I started shooting a bow when I was a kid and just never put my toys away. Actually, you know, and uh, but uh, it's all personal satisfaction. But yeah, we've been we've been shooting bows and arrows as uh, as long as I can remember when we were little kids. Actually, oh. So, uh, been at it a long time i'm 72 i'm 72 years old now i'm still playing my same toys <laughs> i i remember you as uh as a kid i remember you know reading um so i believe you wrote magazine articles uh yeah i started i started writing magazine articles in the 70s probably somewhere in there and uh, you know it just uh it kind of grew I wrote my first book in 1980, or first hunting book in 1980, I think it was, and um, it sold a lot. Uh, you know, back in those days, I had information um, that hadn't been exploited at the time. Um, I had uh, a lot of it was just theories, and I was wrong sometimes. And but at one point in my life, I spent all my free time in the outdoors, in the woods, and, and I had a passion for white-tailed deer, especially, and shooting bows and arrows, and it kind of just came together, you know, and uh, and that's actually my brother, I don't know, I, I shouldn't say this, uh, because I don't think, um, I don't think it's for a sure statement, but as far as I know, uh, my brother uh, shot the first, the very first uh, deer ever killed on production video and it was uh in other words we actually carried we had video camera i say video cameras movie cameras he started taking you know it was eight millimeter regular eight and then went to super eight and then went to high eight and then went to um vhs and then went to you know uh digital and then you know and then um, high def and all that sort of thing but everything keeps evolving but he started taking, my brother started filming uh, some of our hunts in the 60s, uh, in the early 60s, actually. And um, it just, uh, but anyway, he killed the first two deer. They they did a, 
Uh, actually, I wasn't a part of it. I was there, but I was in the background. But he did bow hunting October whitetails. Was one of the first VHS tapes ever come out, uh, and that would be, I'm going to say, in the right around 1980 or thereabouts. Um, but anyway, he killed two bucks on that um, on that tape, and that's that tape. Actually, in that when we, I say when we, when when that tape came out, um, it was in like I'm going to say 80, 81, somewhere in there. And um, it sold for thirty-five. It was a VHS tape, and it sold for thirty-five bucks, which was a lot of money back then. And now, I mean, that same tape you can you can buy that that video part one and part two on one DVD disc, one DVD disc, and I think it's ten bucks or something like that. But you know, prices of some things go down. But uh, but you know, we've been around a long time, and and you know, back when when uh, Camo wasn't cool, so to speak, you know, and and uh, things have changed, you know. But it's it's having a passion and doing something you really love to do. Um, it's um, it's just our life, you know. Has always been in the outdoors, doing stuff, having a good time, and doing it. Hopefully, doing it for the right reasons. You know, I recently had a uh, uh, interview conversation with Dr. Grant Woods, and we got on the topic of, uh, you know, what we did as kids. And uh, I, I don't know that what we did as kids is, you know, um, a whole lot different, um, you know, between you and I than uh, the way it is now. And I know the way it is now is, is completely different, but, you know, I remember. Uh, my goodness, the night before I legally I was able to go squirrel hunting, I remember it like it was yesterday only because I didn't sleep the entire night. Um, right. and, and I didn't get to go, uh, you know, I didn't get to go deer hunting. Um, I got to go squirrel hunting. And, and yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what, it, I, I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep the whole night. My friend Dan and I still, uh, to this day, he, he spent the night at my house because it was my birthday. My birthday is the 15th of September. And, and that just happened to be when it opened. And my goodness i could i could not sleep a wink i was up every 10 minutes and, up. <laughs> yeah. and that's the way it's supposed to be you know that is the way it's supposed to be but nowadays kids you know they don't they don't even play outdoors as much as they used to you know i mean it is i mean i was raised i was born in pennsylvania raised in new england vermont in particular and Went to school in Indiana and then moved. I lived in Montana, western Montana, for about 30 years before I moved to Iowa. But when I grew up, you know, I mean, we um, we did things differently. We built forts. We played cowboys and Indians outside, and I was always the Indian because I liked bows and arrows. And, you know, we would, we would uh, I remember riding a, my bike. I, uh, I, I, uh, I was riding my my bike. Didn't have any fenders. Didn't have a mirror. Didn't have a basket. Didn't have hand brakes. Didn't have. I wore it with. With I rode a bike with no helmet. You know, God help me. I know. I can't believe you're alive. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, carried a pocket knife. Uh, oh Lord. <laughs> carried a pocket knife. Fought without using the knife and all that sort of thing. But I remember one time I was riding my bike, and I come home and uh, I was I was out out in out rural, you know, and. And I saw a snake, and I wanted to. And I, threw, I jumped off the bike and caught the snake. And I wanted to take him home, and I had the, the right handlebar grip was off of the bike handlebars, and I t- popped off the handlebar grip and held a snake up there, and boy, he slid right in there. And I put the handlebar grip back on and rode home. I got him home, and I took the handlebar grip off and tried to get him out. He wouldn't come out, and I, you know, he, I, I tried to get him out, but you know, and the left handlebar grip was glued on. I couldn't break that seal, and it was too tight for him to make a a U turn. And apparently, snakes don't have reversed. I couldn't get him out of it, so I just put the handlebar grip back on, and went about my life. And about a, I don't know, it was probably a month and a half later. My dad was in a garage and said, "What's that smell coming from this bike?" You know, and and uh, <laughs> we went over, and, and I kind of confessed what I did, and, and he, of course he he was an adult and popped a, he took both of the handlebar grips up and held a hose up there, and what came out was not was not pretty, you know, and he had to wash that that poor snake, you know, uh, spent the rest of his life inside my handlebars, but you know, and I remember when I started I started. 
trap, and, and it's a, I'll, I'll cut this story short, but first animal that I caught was a muskrat, and he was still alive, he had leg hole trap up against the creek bank. And I jumped down in the creek, and uh, I didn't know what to do, so I started punching him. <laughs> I punched this poor muskrat in the head until he died, you know. I got him up against the creek bank and just kept punching him, and finally he passed away. And I took him home. My dad said, I told my dad, you know, he was pretty messy. And uh, and I, my dad said, why didn't you use a club? And I said, I never thought of it, you know. And anyway, but, uh, you know, as you get, as you get kids, now, you know, they're, again, their mindset. I remember, <laughs> I'll tell you one, I remember uh, soda straws. When I was a kid, soda straws weren't made out of plastic. They're made out of spun wax paper, and they're a lot narrower diameter than they are nowadays. And, you know, we had to take milk money to school and all that sort of deal. But anyway, we could shoot wooden matches. If A wooden match would run inside a soda straw, and you could run a needle. If you, if you took a, a, a burnt match, just use the wood part, and run a needle up the center of it and put it in a soda straw, I mean, you, it would stick in plaster. It'd stick in anything except glass and metal, you know. I mean, but anyway, and somewhere along the line, I learned that you can put a soda straw up the butt of a live frog and don't want to inhale, but you you can blow a frog up to the size of an apple. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a one-way valve there, and the air won't come out. And and it would blow a frog up to about the size of an apple and throw them out in the pond, and there's so much air in it, their 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 leg, two legs can't hit the water at the same time. So only one, they're they can only swim with one leg, and they would swim around, and then we'd shoot them with our BB guns while they're, <laughs> I mean, pretty brutal stuff, you know, but but that's the way kids were, that's the way we did, you know, boys will be will be, will be boys type things. I remember catching suckers and. Anywhere around the Fourth of July, you have those little uh, Chinese firecrackers and stick a sucker, you know, stick a firecracker in their mouth and light it and blow their heads off and pretty brutal stuff, you know. And but anyways, but nowadays, you know, kids don't build forts, they don't go into the woods, they don't study tracks, they, you know, I mean, they don't, they don't know, they don't know anything. It's not that they don't know; half of them don't even care, you know. Um, you want to learn something about, you know, what, what, you know, what this track is and what this animal is doing and, and how this, the whole mother nature thing works, you know, and there's no interest. There's a, you know, just put me in a good spot type attitude. You know, that's all they care about or drop me off at the mall, you know? Right. But anyway, like I said, times have changed. So definitely. Well, but, if, if you could, if you could tell my 16 year old son, one thing about deer hunting, um, what what would what 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 tip would you give him? And there's far greater things, uh, far 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 more important things than than deer hunting. There's more. Well, more. First of all, I would I, I tell people that when, where, and how people hunt is not nearly as important as why. You know. Um, they have to, and hunting, you know, first of all, you know, hunting is, is called a sport, but it's not a sport. I mean, baseball, basketball, football, you know, and even, or game for that matter, you know, golf is a game, tennis, uh, bowling, whatever, you know, it's not a sport. It's not a game. Hunting is 100% instinct. It's a human instinct. Every one of us, you, you know, you get a kid in diapers that can't even walk yet. He's crawling around the floor, and you put a frog in front of him or a turtle or whatever, and he tries to sneak up and catch it, you know, and, and it's instinctive. They want, they want, it's inbred in hunting. Is, it's just, it's no different than eating or sleeping or breathing or reproducing. There's certain, it's a human instinct that every human being has, and if they don't have it, they're just kidding themselves, you know, but hunting for the right reasons the predator prey relationship we are predators man is a predator and deer have been prey species and and we're not at war with deer deer are not targets they're they're prey animals and god put them here you know for us to enjoy and eat you know and and 
if they're out there with the right attitude, hunting for the right attitudes, they got to start off with a good foundation of knowing, you know, it's, uh, it's like building something. You start low. You know, when you're in the woods, as a young as a young hunter, you start out with small game. You don't start out with big game. You start out with small game. You start out, you know, and you graduate or you, there's an apprenticeship there. And too often nowadays, kids want to skip the apprenticeship and they, they're force-fed uh, too much. And they, they, they see television, I think, to a point has changed everything. It's ruined a lot of stuff because... TV hunting shows on TV make it in the eyes of a youngster. It makes it look very easy, and they've they've uh, they they take away they take you know they, the the process is eliminated, and they want to get to the get to the the final goal a lot quicker at the easiest way possible. And the easiest way isn't you know isn't the best way in in a lot of respects you know, but. Anyway, in answer to your question, I think a lot of it has to do with how a kid starts out, and the love is there, you know. I mean, the instinct is there, and I'm just—I'm not just talking hunting or whatever, you know. Um, I have a son; his thing in life is is skiing. I mean, he's—he's he's in his world-class skier, but his, you know, and his—I know guys, you know, they're they're into fishing or even certain, you know, fly fishing or or saltwater fishing, or bass fishing, or, you know, whatever, different types of fishing, or whatever, but hunting, the same thing, you know, um, I mean, you got turkey hunters, and guys that are, their primary interest in life is deer, or, or another guy is primary interest is turkey, another guy is interested in ducks, or whatever, you know, and, and um, small game, that's, you know, it's kind of taking a back seat, and too many youngsters are skipping to page 10 or whatever, you know, and, and they're, uh, getting by, you know, uh, or getting past, the, um, I want to be like that guy on TV. And just cause that guy on TV can make a, a long shot doesn't mean that they have the skill or ability, you know? Um, I mean, I want to get closer. I don't want to get further away. I want to get as close as I can. That's where I get my personal satisfaction is doing it the hard way and getting as close as I can, you know, putting more time and effort into it. So, Anyway, no, I, I I couldn't agree with you more. I I think that um, I'm as guilty. I'll admit my sins right now. Uh, as you're talking about this, I'm I'm thinking. You know what I did is I, I skipped the junior high team. I skipped the freshman team. I skipped the JV team, and you know I didn't go right to college, but I put them right on the varsity team. And yeah. and I took him out and put him in my, you know, deer house and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You let him shoot. Them. I, well, I had a you know a nice bog pod set up where he could you know barely fail yeah. and two hundred and eighteen yards later, a uh, hundred and ten inch, you know, yeah. eight pointer, ten pointer, whatever it was, ten pointer, I guess, um, stepped out and he shot it and and. I, I, my wife and I talk about it often. Uh, you know, she's like, well, why are you always getting his stuff ready? May, you, let him get his own stuff ready. If he doesn't want to go, then don't let him go. And, 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 you know, as I'm, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking, you know, that you're right. You're absolutely right. There, there that, that's, the, I, there are a lot of things that we, um, fundamentally have wrong. Well, and, and at the same point, society now, they, you know, if kids had a choice, they wouldn't do chores. They wouldn't, you know, I mean, they wouldn't, they, they have things that they like to do and they've been programmed to, to, to take the easy route, you know, take the, the, the shortest cut, you know, or to, the shortest way to achieve a goal. The easiest way is not the best way, you know. I mean, it means something to you if you earn, you know, if you earn something. Um, it's, uh, it's like, uh, um, being gifted something and not appreciating, you know, there's a, there's a hollowness, uh, in I, I, you know, when I was guiding, I used to guide deer hunters for seven years. My brother and I guided guys. We took 28 guys a year for seven years. And we had actually, um, probably one of the, we had a 96% success ratio. And this is free, you know, it's, 
free ranging. It wasn't you know high fence thing. But anyway, we had a, almost everybody out of twenty eight guys a year, probably twenty seven of them killed you know eight point or better bucks with a bow and arrow. And but I would see guys walk up to the biggest deer of their life, and there was something. It was, it was like I the, the only word I can use to describe it is there was a hollowness there that they weren't happy or they weren't. I can't say they weren't happy, but they they didn't let their emotions show. Um, they just they get lost in you know what do I do now? I mean it it's like I met a, I met at one time I was at a sports show, and I met a ten year old boy who had already killed his big five in Africa, and that includes elephant, cape buffalo, lion, you know the whole bit. And uh, he was ten years old, and he had already killed his big five in Africa. And I, you know, I come close to asking him what he did for work, you know, but I, I, did, <laughs> I, I didn't, you know, but I, uh, I couldn't, I said, you know, I said to my brother, what caliber of gun do you hand a 10 year old boy to shoot a 50 year old animal that weighs tons? You know, I mean, you know, and what's a kid got to look, look forward to when he gets older, you know, I mean, he's been there, done that, you know, and and I'm not saying there's something wrong with it, but it's 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 there's something missing there, you know. Um, and um, it's just um, people don't earn things anymore, you know. I shouldn't say they don't. I mean, some people obviously do, but you know, youngsters nowadays they they want the easy road, you know. Just put me in a good spot, you know. And like you say, it comes time to get your stuff together, and yet you don't want to. You don't want to shove it down your throat. You know, I remember a buddy of mine one morning, um, I was staying at his house and he was, I was hunting deer and he was, he was going to take his son goose hunting that morning. And the kid, the kid didn't want to go. I mean, you know, it was the, the night before, you know, we, you will go goose hunting with me tomorrow morning, you know, and, and the kid just didn't want to go. I remember I remember another time I was in Africa, uh, hunting in Africa with a guy, and he had brought his, uh, his. I think it, at the time the kid was 17 year old, 16 or 17 year old son with him, and here's and he paid for a hunt, and the kid sat and on, uh, and this would be matter of fact I can tell you why it was 1988, and the kid stayed in camp and he had a girlfriend back in the United States, you know, halfway around the world. And he would talk to that girlfriend for 45 minutes to an hour. I don't know what they, you know, <laughs> charged about a minute back then. <laughs> and he would lay there in bed and come to go, you know, I mean, time to go hunting. He's talking to his girlfriend. And uh, he just didn't want to be there. He he just didn't want to have any interest in, I mean, you know, and then yet, I mean, I know 16-year-olds would give their left arm to, you know, to, to be in Africa, you know, even just be there, never mind hunt or whatever, you know, and and yet, you know, there's people that, they're spoiled, you know, I mean, they just, uh, they um, they don't have the, the ability to to uh, accept something that they earned, you know, they, they don't have the desire to, hey, I'd really like to hunt such and such. You know, I remember one time I was a, uh, I was in a sports show and I was talking to this guy and I didn't say anything to the guy, but he said, I, you know, I need a stone sheep, you know, and I, and I said to myself, you know, nobody needs a stone sheep. I mean, yeah, I'd like to shoot one too, but it's a lot of money nowadays, you know, and, and, you know, um, nobody really needs a stone sheep, you know, and it's just, it's just, uh, there, there, he, he, uh, he was going for trying to make a goal or, or you know, trying to get a you know medal or whatever I don't know, but but anyways, why people do what they do? Why why people, you know, why people would choose to shoot a, a big buck inside a pen, you know, in, a, in an enclosure? You know, it just it just fascinates me, I guess, to a point, you know, and and the the whole um, um, getting a big buck behind a on the back 40 type of thing, you know, or doing it, you know, the right, the right way for the right reasons is, is becoming rare, you know, and it's just, it's a shame actually, but, but that's the way society has changed itself, you know, um, it's, uh, it's just different anyway. Our, our, 
you know, I, I took over this position, um, you know, with Todd in, in White Knuckle, uh, I guess, in July of last year. And I know you've got a Facebook page um, for Brothers of the Bow. You know, I have a Facebook page, but I've never been on it. I, I, lear- <laughs> I learned that last night. <laughs> when your son said, hey, my dad doesn't check this. I'm an old guy, you know, and uh, I don't, I tell you, be honest with you, I've never, I've never used an ATM machine. I still use a compass rather than a GPS. I use a bow, you know, with no wheels on it. I, you know, I, I still climb trees, but I, you know, I do, I do things my way you know i've never i don't know what a blog people talking about blogs and twitter twitter sounds like some a cheerleader would own or something i don't know what that is but anyway i'm not one of those a computer guy you know but um but i enjoy what i'm doing and i you know i like to think i'm you know having a good time and and kind of all comes together more often than not type of deal but but i don't have to you know, I don't have to kill a deer to, to have a good hunt type of thing. You know, and I see guys, I ain't going out today, it's raining or or it's too cold or whatever, you know. And you take, you know, some days it is too cold, but it's not, uh, it, some days it's cold, but it's never too cold. Let's put it that way, you know. Anyway, but. Well, what, um, one of the one of the things that uh, that. I came away with after I started, as I started to say, this position um in in and again Todd's not able to be here uh today and and uh which is unfortunate but hopefully we get you back on the show again cuz I'd love to hear you two uh Good. go back and forth and talk strategy but the Good. the the theme that I kept getting from doing our first shows uh on Facebook live which is where people could you know flash questions on the computer screen and you know we'd start to talk tactics etc the underlying theme every single time that i walked away with was the same simple thing that i said to my son every day of eighth grade that i dropped him off at school you gotta do the work you gotta put the time in there just is there's there is no substitute for doing the work. And I, I, I sense that if I were to ask you uh, a question and ask her a, a, a one word answer and, and ask you, you know, do you hunt more or scout more? Um, I probably, uh, you know, as far as time, and I, I I'm going to say I scout more than I hunt, but that being said, I hunt a lot more than the average guy. I mean, I put a lot more time in the woods um, during season. Uh, I'm not scouting as much as I am hunting during season. But there's seasons, you know, is is only part of the year. You know, it's roughly a quarter of the year your, your season's open with a bow and arrow, and three-quarters of it it's not. I mean, I was out, what's today? Today's Tuesday. Um, I didn't go out yesterday, but I spent all day Sunday from, well, from after church until dark. Uh, I was in the woods the day before on Saturday. I was in, in the woods like five, six hours, something like that. Um, you know, and it's just, it's what I do, you know, and a lot of the, and you're always learning stuff, you know, I mean, I've been looking for shed antlers and I put a lot of miles and, I'm convinced as of today, you know, where it's Valentine's Day, um, I I actually, I think at least at least 50%, probably closer to 70% of the bucks in, in our county still packing antlers. You know, they're carrying their antlers later this year. And what makes that interesting, now I noticed I passed up a really big buck. Well, he didn't have any antlers, but his scabs were very healthy. Or you know, big around, good circumference bases. He walked right into the tree, and he was a nice buck. But he had shed his both his antlers right around Christmas time. I don't remember the date, but I thought, wow, you know, that's. I, and I usually pick out the first shed somewhere around December seventeenth, eighteenth, something like that. Um, and it'll be, you know, on an annual basis, I'll find one or the first one right around then. But after, uh, let's say, right around Christmas to January tenth. Um, I saw quite a few deer that had lost one antler 
uh, or both antlers. I say quite a few. I saw, you know, more than I thought I, I should see. And I got trail camera pictures of some as well, you know. And I thought, wow, they're, they're shedding, a lot of deer shedding early this year. But then it stopped, you know. And, and uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the, which is the length of the day, the amount of daylight and all that sort of thing. But a lot of it has to do with the temperatures. And that cold weather kind of passed. We've essentially had a pretty mild winter so far, except for that one little, like a 10-day zero snap there. But but a lot of these deer um, are still, you know, I got a trail camera picture yesterday morning of a nice buck, you know, with both antlers yesterday morning, you know. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I had a guy, a, f- a friend of mine, uh, was looking for shed antlers um, in uh, Illinois uh, this last weekend, and um, he was driving around right before dark, and he counted 19 bucks, still had both antlers that he saw from, from you know, rural road type of deal, you know, standing in, you know, in food plots or pig corn or whatever, you know, and and a lot of them. But anyway, what I'm getting at is that you, you learn stuff or come up with stuff, information, you know, while you're out there. I'm I'm always looking for a bit. I'm a tree stand hunter because I, you know, I mostly hunt out of stands and, uh, and I'm always looking, you know, for the best tree, you know, when I need to move. Like right now, I have multiple tree stands that I want to move. Um, you know, I got a better place for that stand. It's not that it's not in a good place, but it's, I found a better place and I want to, I might only move it 50 yards or whatever, you know, but I, I want to move it, you know, and and it, at my age, I'm mean, 72 years old, and and my my mind says I want to, I can do something or I want to do something, and my body starts yelling at me, you know. Um, like I said this weekend, I can I can push myself. Um, I mean, but you know, I, about four hours, five hours of of walking, and I'll take a rest once in a while, but four or five hours of walking, and I'm I'm pretty tired out where there was a point in my life where i'd go you know dawn to dusk and if i wanted to walk all day and and i'm a fat guy you know i mean i you know i remember i've been matter of fact i had a heart attack two years ago um and i was out looking for shed antlers I, i'll i'll share you i was i was two two young well they weren't young they were two one one of them was 39 the other was 42 years old i think it was but anyway, two young guys with me, and uh, we were looking for shed antlers, and we covered quite. We'd walk pretty most of the day, and I heard one of them um, say to you know, one of them said to the other one, you know, I can't believe that old fart's you know keeping up with us, you know, and uh, and anyway, we got back to the truck, and I had um, I had left a bunch of water, and I I usually take it with a pack, but anyway, I had four sixteen ounce bottles of water in the back of the in the in my, inside the p- pickup truck and i had bought some of this flavored water flavor and the meal that the fla- water enhanced you know the flavor type stuff you know anyway I, I bought this uh a flavor called green thunder and i thought it was like green apple or green tea or something i don't know i didn't know what it was but here in it's it's energy drink anyway i drank four 16 ounce bottles you know um of uh of a uh, red bull but essentially you know energy drink and man my heart took off and and i gave myself a heart attack you know i mean it, you know and but i had a luckily actually it, it worked out for the better because i had three blockages and had i not had i not done that or you know had a you know they, they didn't run the the test uh you know and determined it was you know i needed a triple bypass you know, I might have had, I might be dead right now. You know, I would have had a big one sooner or later, more sooner probably than later. But anyway, but you push yourself and, and you get to a certain age. And I keep forgetting that, you know, I don't like to, my wife does not like me to hunt alone. You know, I mean, she wants to know where I am and, you know, and I, and I tell her, you know, I mean, here's where I'm going to be today or where I write it down, you know, this is where I'm going to be type of thing if I'm out there by myself because you don't show up. But it's uh, it's one of those deals that, that uh, as time goes on, you know, but I'm out there all the time trying to learn stuff, you know, and, and that's what fascinates me. You know, um, you think you know, I'll tell you, I'll give you another example. You know, you think you know everything there is to know about white-tailed deer. I had a, a good friend of mine last season. 
He's sitting on a side hill, and this um, this white-tailed buck was chasing. And it was a decent buck. Apparently, he was like, I think he said he was either two and a half or three and a half years old. But yeah, it was a decent-sized buck, and he was chasing this doe all over the side of this uh, it, uh, timbered, you know, uh, hardwood ridge. And he said they come by several times. And he said the doe, he said the buck, and it was right on the doe, and one or both of them had their tongue hanging out. And he says they got, the, the buck was about, I don't know, I think he said it was like 30, 40 yards from him. And he says all of a sudden the buck just stopped. He was out of gas. And he said he stopped and stood there and his tongue hung out. He says all of a sudden he laid down. And he said that deer laid there. And he says he laid down for a minute or so. And next thing he went over and he, he laid completely down on the ground like a dead dog, like a dead deer. You know, he had his head on the ground. Uh, his neck and the whole body. He was laying on his side, with his with his body all on the ground. And Richard said, "I looked at him with binoculars, and I thought, man, did he die? You know, he wasn't moving. And he says he he thought he was dead. He and he says he he just laid down like he died. You know, and he said he laid there without moving. He said I put my binoculars on him, and he says, honest to God, he says all of a sudden." You ever watch a dog dream, you know, when they're chasing a rabbit or something in their dreams? And he says that buck started kicking all four of his feet, and he was dreaming about shooting that, or about shooting that. He was dreaming about chasing that doe, and they were, he was, his all four feet were twitching on the end, and, you know, like a dog. You've seen dogs, you know, uh, they're dreaming about shoot, chasing a cat or a rabbit, and their all four feet will, or will move, at the, you know, when they're dreaming. And I never realized it big bucks dream about chasing does you know <laughs> anyway and it would have been really neat he didn't have a, a, a camera with him it would have been really neat to get that on film though um if he said that thing laid there and you know and finally it woke up and got up and took off again you know but he said you know i didn't realize it deer dream you know and that's pretty cool when you think about it anyway yeah i, did, I guess i didn't uh i didn't know that either it's uh yeah. I, I mean it makes it's sense because you, like you said, oh, yeah, dogs it do it. And... It's a lot of it's a lot of it's logic when you think about it. You know, and it, uh, it's uh, what well, I learned something else. I see my memory isn't so hot, but uh, I learned something else. It's logical as can be, um, but I, you know, I didn't realize, it, uh, and I, I can't tell you that story because I can't remember what it was. You know, but I so I guess I didn't learn it good enough. But it'll come to me tomorrow probably. <laughs> So anyway, you you've been hunting for you know I don't know how I started hunting when I was a little kid, um, literally all my life. Um, my dad, um, I was born in Pennsylvania, raised in New England, Vermont in particular. Um, went to school in Indiana, and then spent most of my life in Western Montana. And I moved out there just because I wanted to raise a family and in good 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 hunting good fishing type of thing you know anyway and the reason matter of fact i retired moved to iowa in 1999 and the only reason i moved here was because of the it has bigger deer you know and there's no winter kill essentially and and uh, at the time we had, didn't have ehd around here which i do now but but it's not nearly as bad as it was in montana but i just wanted to live someplace where the you know, I mean, Iowa is one big food plot as far as I'm concerned, you know, but but I've been hunting, I don't know how many different states I've killed whitetails in, I don't know, I'm going to say at least 15 different states, but the problem is you can only be in one place at a time, and, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to waste my, I shouldn't say waste my time, but I don't want to spend my time hunting in a an area that doesn't have big bucks and and you know doesn't have the opportunity to to you know a lot of it has to do with with age structure and hunting pressure you know i mean back east you know i did a i did a road seminar circuits for 7 years actually i did it i did like 60 seminar speaking engagements uh per year for 7 years okay and uh, anyway but you're dealing in, in back east um, the, the difference in uh, how they hunt deer and and um, you know uh, poaching and the 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 I mean where they hunt deer you know I mean I talked to guys that were parking in you know 
Dunkin' Donuts parking lot, you know, to go deer hunting type of thing behind a donut shop. And, uh, and you know, dropped me off here. I talked to another guy in New Jersey. He was taking a cab, you know, you know tell a taxi cab deer hunting. Get out here, you know. Pick me up at 6 o'clock. I'll be into that tree over there, you know. And, and uh, you know, that sort of, sort of thing. But how people... How people react, you know, uh, and how they how they do things, uh, different parts of the country. I know guys. I know good, good, really skilled deer hunters that will die as old men and never ever kill a big buck, simply because not through lack of skill, but through lack of opportunity. I mean, they have the skill, but. The deer have to live old enough to get big racks, you know, or to reach maturity. And a lot of people, you know, I keep, we talk about quality deer management, and I keep saying, you know, don't pick the fruit before it's ripe, you know. And and it's, uh, if you want big bucks, you know, you can't be filling your tag with the first one that walks by you. you got to be a little bit selective, you know, and it's just, it's just like using fish as an analogy. You know, there's a lot more, you look at bass, there's a lot more one-pound bass than there are two-pounders, a lot more two-pounders there are three-pounders and on the way up. You know, you want a 10-pound bass, you know, you're not going to catch them. you got to catch a lot of bass or fish for 10-pounders before you, in a, an area that has 10-pounders, before you're going to catch one, you know, and it's just as simple as that. Uh, I mean, as simple as that, assuming that you know what you're doing, you know. But, you know, you, if you don't put, the, and that's one of the, like I said, I put a lot of time in, and I um, I see a lot of big bucks, and I pass up a lot of bucks that most guys would shoot. And I, but that's, that's what I choose to do. I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't necessarily want to punch my tag, you know, uh, too early. Um, and, you know, it's like, matter of fact, it, it upsets, uh, and I, 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 I won't say who, who says it, but I, I know a guy on one of the TV shows, you know, whenever he kills a deer, he'll say, we are done in Kansas. We are done in Iowa. We are done where he happens to be hunting. He'll shoot a big buck and he says, we are done in Kansas. And it's, and my interpretation of that is, I mean, the guy's like, he's, on a job site and we're done with it. let's go kill another one some other place you know and you know i don't know it just it just rubs me the wrong way that there's people that just they're in it you know, watch how quick i can you know watch how you know uh it's like a fighter it's let me let, let me see how quick i can knock this guy out and give me somebody else and i'll make you know i mean they're like he's getting paid by the deer or getting paid by the by the punch or whatever you know or the the you know you know what i'm saying just uh it's just um, they're being push, 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 you know, go, go, go. We're done in Kansas. Let's go to Ohio. You know, we're done in Ohio. Let's go to Indiana, you know. And that's nice to a point, but there again, you can only be in one, you know, up in the middle of November, you're not going to find me in Pennsylvania or I probably, have, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's places in Pennsylvania, but I'm talking about, you know, um, you know, you're not. Gonna, that's why guys go not to go out of state to hunt. That's why guys come to Iowa. You know, that's why guys, you know, are willing to pay, you know, 500 bucks for a piece of paper that that uh, you know allows them to shoot a you know a, a big buck in Iowa or hunt a big buck in Iowa. You know, I mean, they're they're paying for the opportunity. You know, and it just uh, that's the way it is. You know, I mean, you want big fish, you got to. Fish where the big fish exist in a in a pond that's been managed to produce big fish, you know, and allow them to get bigger, you know. But anyway, well, yeah, Q- QDM certainly is is a uh, is a oh yeah a huge piece of the puzzle. And actually, and there and yet there's a lot of people there's a lot of people that don't like that. I mean, you know, and I can you know I remember when I lived in Western Montana, we had some really good trout fishing. And they had sections of of certain rivers. This is fly fishing only, catch and release. And then they had other sections where you know, bring a can of worms and you know, gilt crushers type of thing. Take them all home, keep as many as you want, put them in a frying pan, and and catch them at worms. You know, and this section of river was was selective, and this section was not. 
But what happens after a period of time, the worm guys will say, hey, you guys got all the big fish. We'll let you fish our section of river if you let us fish yours. And that's not... They don't, they're too stupid to realize that the reason there's big fish in that section of river is because people aren't putting them in a frying pan. They're putting them back in, you know, and, and it's the same thing with big deer, you know, or old deer, mature deer, you know. Um, they're not all going to turn into Boone and Crockett class animals, but to get them, to get them there, you got to have, you got to let the, fri- the fruit ripen, you know, and, uh, and they gotta they gotta mature, and you gotta let them walk. You know they're almost there. That deer needs one more year, you know, and and until he gets that year, or if he gets that year, he might be something special, you know. But but if everybody is just you know, hey, I'll sneak this one home and not tag it, you know, that sort of thing, it adds up, and people, you know, that's that's the wrong attitude, and wrong way to do it. And plus, it's illegal, you know. Anyway, but. That's just uh, that's the way it is. Different parts of the country, it's different, and that's why I go out. Guys come to Iowa, and that's why, you know, guys go out of state to hunt whatever elk or whatever. You know. Anyway. So back to if I can just pick your brain and uh, abuse yeah. your knowledge a little bit on uh, on deer hunting. Um, when Gene Wenzel's out scouting in September. Yeah. What's he looking for? Um, um, first of September, you know, is I assume most of the the velvet's going to shed, and you know they've been in pretty much bachelor groups, and some of them will hang on. You know, age structure will be, um, and and trail cameras actually will tell you a lot of this kind of stuff. But as far as timing, but let's say the first of September or thereabouts. Now out in a lot of states deer season opens the first of September. Uh scattered over in here in in Iowa it's it's October first, you know, but but in September I'm looking for undisturbed deer and most of them are undisturbed actually on in September, but the the beginning of the month, um they're gonna get out of velvet and they they start getting that shot of testosterone in their in their in their system, and they start acting like men rather than buddies you know and I say men that men can be buddies, you know what I'm saying, but it's it's uh they get more interest and they can feel it in the air type of thing and as it gets on towards October you know, and when the season opens i mean they usually i mean they they might be still hanging if on an undisturbed deer they might still be hanging. You know, in the it, it's mostly evening hunting. Uh, you know, that's when they're moving out towards the the uh, feeding areas. You know, right before dark or you know whatever. But they're not quite thinking. You know, as the the month of October increases, then they start becoming individuals and give me my space, and they're not buddies anymore, and that sort of sort of thing. You know, but in September itself, I'm more or less. I'm 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 trying to find bucks or find bucks that I'm willing to or not willing to but uh, have the desire to you know hey he's a good deer or you know find multiple good bucks that I can not work on either isn't the right term but but I can I can figure out you know what they're doing how to hunt them type of thing thing you know and and but I'm kind of formulating in September you're isolating different deer and forming a plan and then as you get into october you you more or less start um working your way into um patterning a deer more so and 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 then again uh, you know if you get um you get on a new piece of this is kind of interwoven in that question but if i get a if i get permission to hunt a new farm that i uh, you know that i haven't set foot on it usually takes me three years to get to the point where I'm comfortable. I know the best spot. Even putting a lot of time in, I'm talking to, you know, I'll change my mind on deer movement or, you know, just uh, a couple of days ago, day four, yes, it was Saturday. Um, Saturday, I, I found a, a spot, and I had put a tree stand there, and the tree stand's been there for four years, a ladder stand. And but the deer they were crossing a um, uh, a drainage ditch, 
and um, they quit crossing it. It got, it was um, it kind of grew over, and it and a tree fell. What what happened? But they they moved, and they're now they're crossing probably another I don't know twenty feet further. They're crossing that ditch in a different spot that they, they they did two years ago, you know. And and I mean I can still shoot out of that stand, but what I'm getting at is you'll see that certain trails, you know, you know um, novice hunters they think. God put down deer trails for deer to walk on, you know, and it's not the way. A deer trail is nothing except deer. I mean, I'm, I'm taking away the fact it could be cattle too, but where there's no cattle or domestic livestock, you see a game trail, and a game trail is nothing but animal tracks formed, and it's usually the easiest way to get from point A to point B, taking in con- into consideration cover security. And the, the you know they'll go around. They're essentially lazy and a deer aren't that you know they're pretty lazy. I say lazy. Um, if they you give them the shortest route and it's just as secure, they're going to walk around a, a thicket or whatever you know rather than go right <clears throat> through the middle of it. And you can encourage deer, and I do it all the time. I mean I'll you know I'll walk. I carry a pair of belt pruners, you know, snippers, ratchet pruners on my belt and if I get briars that across a deer trail, I mean I snip them out of the way. Make you know, make it easier for a deer to get through there and I can encourage them by the same token I can block off trails, you know. You get and I do I I mean I do stuff like this routinely and I had some guy at one point, I don't know, you know, hey, I never thought of that, you know, and I I assumed everybody did that, you know, and I mean you get to a fork in a trail and and you want the deer to walk by the fork that goes by your stand, you block off the other fork, you know. I mean, where it forks, you just block it off and encourage them, you know, uh, you encourage them to take the, the right fork that passes 15 yards from your tree stand rather than the left fork that passes 40 yards from your tree stand, you know. I mean, you can encourage a deer to, not you're not forcing it to do it, but just... Make it, give them the easiest route, you know, and open that thick stuff up and block off other stuff. And you can make them do what you want them to do, you know. In any event, it's it just, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, you you ask yourself, why did I put my tree stand here? And I, like I said, I mean, I think I told you earlier, I got probably half a dozen stands out there that I need to move. And they're in good spots right now. Uh but, you know, I got a better spot, you know, and, it, and it's just a matter of it might be 20, 25 yards away, and I should have I seen that before I put this first stand up. But, you know, as you sit in a stand, you see how deer move by, and, and for one reason or another, they'll do something differently uh, this year rather than last year. You know, you can adapt to them. You know, the guys, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll talk to a guy, and he'll say, I don't know why those deer – there, I'm sitting in my stand, and a whole bunch of deer are walking by me about 80 yards over there, and I don't know why they're going through there, but I'm going to figure it out. And I can't help but say to myself, quit worrying about why they're going through there and get your butt over there. You know, they're sitting in the wrong spot. You know, I mean, if you see deer going by to out of range, go over there. You know, I mean, move yourself over there. I mean, if it, I mean, it's something you see over and over and again. Or put a trail camera there, you know, and, and, you know, don't worry about why they're going through there. You can figure it out, you know, it might be interesting, but bottom line is if you see them do something, you know, that's repetitious or ha- habitual pattern type of thing, capitalize on it. That's not, you know, that's not cheating. It's just smart, you know, taking, you know, taking an opportunity when they offer it, you know. Anyway, but. So it sounds like. You either use the structure or yeah, I do. make the structure. I do both. Right. I use the structure and I make the structure both. And, and you know, I assume uh, to a certain extent, um, I, I guess I assume a lot of guys do that, and apparently a lot of them don't, you know. Um, studying, and the same thing with wind. I mean, Air movement and wind, understanding wind and air movement. A lot of guys uh, 
they they just I don't know I I shouldn't say they don't know what they're doing but they don't utilize um, logic in in deer movement uh, the how wind moves you know I mean and I, here again it's I don't want to open this whole subject but but air movement depends on the velocity and air will move different if it's moving under five miles an hour once it okay to use an example you get a big boulder let's say the size of a car that's sitting in the middle of a flat field and you when the wind comes across that field a breeze comes across and it hits that rock it'll it you you always think of wind as is invisible water without the gravity and it'll hit that rock and some of it'll go around the left side some will go around the right side and it'll form an eddy on the back side and keep going well when that velocity that wind picks up and it gets 10 miles 15 miles an hour the wind starts it goes up over top of the rock and it starts going around the rock quicker and you know how the air moves around it you know and then you then you throw in terrain differences then you throw in if it's if there's if it's not a field it's a bunch of trees and then you throw in the fact that if, if the trees have leaves on them you know, when, when when a breeze hits a tree that has no leaves, it's going to act differently than if it hits a tree line where there's still leaves on the on the tree. You know, it'll actually, here's another thing, too, the shape of the leaves. If you get a tree where the leaves are drooping down, when an, and, a, and I'm talking a slight breeze, a thermal type of thing, but when it hits a, a leaf that's drooping down, that air is forced up that leaf, and it's up into the tree, and then when it goes through the tree, it's the other side, and it's forced back down by the drooping leaves on the other side. So it act the air goes lifts through that. You know, and I'm talking about a, a, a hardwood basically with leaves that droop. You know, you get a pine tree. Okay, Christmas trees, or as they call them, Christmas trees, evergreens. You know, the type of Christmas trees. One type, the 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 boughs all hang down. They swoop down, you know, and the other type, the boughs all swoop up, you know. Um, they'll, 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 you know, they won't be horizontal. They'll be raised up. And how the air moves through a, a, a pine, you know, that the boughs hang down versus versus the ones that came up, it'll change the air movement, you know. And and little stuff like that is as when air determined deer. I see a lot of bucks, especially, um, and my brother calls them slow walkers. But they'll stand in in areas when the the wind. They don't like they don't like high winds, and they don't like no wind. They want to and and if the and the breeze is very minimal, a deer will stand in one spot and wait until it changes before he moves forward. You know, and when he's and there, I'm I'm just talking safety. Yeah, when they got when they start looking for hot does, and you get a buck that's looking for a hot doe, you know a lot of guys think that they use a nose wind, and they they do at times. But if they've learned how to use the wind, they quarter downwind. You know they don't quarter upwind. They uh, they don't use a nose wind. If they're using a nose wind, the only thing they can smell is what's directly in front of them. All right, if they're using a uh, a quartering downwind, these you know. It's that air is coming over their left shoulder, for instance. You know, they can cover a whole lot more olfactory ground, you know, by their scent ground is what I'm getting at. By you go, going when the wind's quartering downwind, it's coming over their left shoulder, and they're using their eyes to look in front of them, their nose, to, you know, to to pick up a hot doe. When they hit a hot doe, then they'll make a J turn. If they hit it, if they smell a hot doe, they'll make a J turn and they'll then they'll follow the nose wind right to the hot doe. But until then, they're quartering downwind, you know. And um, and it's just if the if that deer's learned how to use the wind, that's what they do. And the only matter of fact, one of the reasons that he that he grew to be a, a an old buck or a mature buck is the fact that they learn how to use. You know, some deer, certain deer are smarter than others. You know, and just like people, I guess. But you get a, a white-tailed buck or even a doe. Some of the smartest animals in the woods are doe deer, and especially if they raise two, three sets of fawns or more, you know. And and but if they've learned how to use the wind um, in secure situations, those are the deer that live to be seven, eight years old or more, you know. Uh, if they don't, 
You know, they just, I mean, for years, I mean, you sit in trees and you see a buck going by you and I say, you know, he's not supposed to be going that direction. You know, I'll see deer going upwind, downwind, crosswind, all that sort of thing. And, you know, they do, they, they move different directions, but if they learn how to use the wind, they'll, they'll use it. I mean, they, you know, they'll use other deer as decoys. They'll wait for temperature changes. They'll wait till the, you know, I ain't going over there until I know it's safe, you know, and <clears throat> anyways, it's just, it's one of those things that's, that's what makes them white-tailed deer. That's what makes them so adaptable to predator-prey relationships, you know, and that's what makes them so challenging is to get it, to get them inside that 20-yard line or whatever. I mean, that's where I get my jollies. I mean, that's where I get, you know, the personal satisfaction. I love to have a deer walk by me and, you know, he has no idea that the boogeyman is right there, you know, and, and uh, you know, I might not even shoot him, but, I mean, I'll have... I, I don't call it a wasted day. Anytime I can, I can outsmart a deer, especially a mature deer, even a doe. And you know, I could have, I could have shot him or I could have shot her. Um, that's what makes a good day for me, you know. And I want to do it. I want to earn it. I want to figure out what's going to happen. I want the, 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 you know, thing to come together. Everything close the deal. And I sometimes I don't close the deal, or. And what's really frustrating when you don't do anything wrong and you still, you know, you come 95% or better on closing the deal and it doesn't happen, you know. I mean, that's frustrating. But then again, you know, you look at it as as it's a learning experience too, you know. I mean, just because you it doesn't come together, you can hopefully learn something from it too, you know. But that's what makes it what it is. Well, there you have it. My conversation with Gene Wenzel. Uh, I know it was all over the board and it was hard to not be all over the board with a guy that possesses so much knowledge, not just about the deer woods, but about really life in general. And I think you probably recognize that as you listened along here. One of the things that I really like that Gene said in our conversation is the how, the where, the when etc. isn't nearly as important as the why. And you know he's right. He's spot on. The why is different for all of us, but recognizing the why I think is very important. And I know I'm getting deep and off on a subject that probably is boring to many of you, but it certainly needs to be said, especially when we have an industry like the outdoor industry that to a large degree has really made the dream of killing a 180 inch or 190 inch or 200 inch deer the standard and for most of us let's face it that's not the standard the standard is maybe a 140 inch deer or 130 inch deer for that matter the bottom line is exactly what gene and i talked about the why Everybody's why is going to be different, and that's fine. Just remember that when you go out hunting or whatever it is that you're doing, to make it authentically yours and not to try and live up to some standard that's been set by a TV show, etc. Just be authentically you and have a good time, because as Todd's often said, if you're not having fun, it's not worth doing. Well, I think I've probably rambled on enough for one day. Thank you all for listening in. For iTunes and iPad and iPod and iEverything subscribers, grab your iPhone and go ahead and review our show, please. Uh, if you can't find it, go ahead and type in the word in the search box in the iTunes store, White Knuckle Podcast. This will help you to download the free podcast app that is produced by Apple and then subscribe to the show from within that app. Every time I produce an episode, you will get it downloaded right to your iDevice. For Android listeners, download the Stitcher Radio app it's free and it will do the exact same thing as the itunes app if you've already got some other podcasting client again just put in the word white knuckle podcast but more important than any of that please give us your feedback whether it's on facebook in a review or wherever let us know how we can get better at doing what it is that we do without your feedback we don't know what it is that we can do to make our show more informative and more enjoyable for you 
And with that, I'm going to leave you with my final thought of the week. And that thought comes from Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. With that, thanks again for listening. Go out there and have a good rest of your week. And also, go out there and be awesome.